Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight's forum event hosted by the Institute of Politics and Public Service at the McCourt School of Public Policy, known to many of you as GU Politics. We're hosting this event in partnership with the Pew Research Center. My name is Libby Larson, and I'm a first year in Georgetown College, majoring in political economy and history. Throughout my time at Georgetown, I've had the opportunity to get involved with GU Politics, serving on Brian Stelter's student strategy team, and I've also been a part of Moot Court in the Georgetown Undergraduate Student Association. I'm pleased to introduce to you all of our guests for this discussion this evening. Tonight, we're joined by Jocelyn Kiley, Associate Director of Research at the Pew Research Center, Tony Fabrizio, Chief Pollster for President Trump's 2016 and 2020 campaigns, and John Anzalone, Chief Pollster for President Biden's 2020 campaign. Thank you all so much for being here. Tonight, our panel will not only dive into the trends behind the American electorate one year ahead of the 2022 midterms, but also shed light on the nuances of a divided American public beyond the partisan lens. Please join this conversation on social media by tagging GU Politics using at GU Politics. I'll now hand it over to our moderator for this evening, GU Politics's Executive Director, Ms. Mo Alethi. Thanks. Uh, let me thanks so much. Appreciate the introduction. Um, and Jocelyn, thank you and Pew for partnering with us uh, on this. If um, uh, those of you who haven't seen it yet, we'll get a chance to see it tonight. But these guys do a pretty interesting political typology quiz um, that helps shed light on the electorate. And we're going to use that as our, our launching point. The, the title of tonight's conversation is Diagnosing the Divide. This is something I have been very focused on since returning to Georgetown a couple years ago uh, to work at geopolitics. Because a lot of people ask all the time, like, why do, does politics feel so bad right now? Why is it so polarized right now? And I think it's a legit question, and we're going to talk about that tonight. I always point out, though, it ain't like it's always been sunshine and roses, right? Our politics has always been edgy at best. We've had one nonpartisan president in the history of the republic and the race to succeed him between Adams and Jefferson. They called each other liars, thieves, scoundrels, and much worse. We've had canings on the floor of the House of Representatives. We had a, went to war with ourselves over whether or not we were going to keep people in bondage. We could go on and on. <laughs> Over the past few centuries, it has been, we have been very polarized. But it feels worse right now to many of us. And we're going to talk about that tonight with three people who spend a lot of time thinking about voters, thinking about the electorate. And so I want to start by kicking it over to Jocelyn to walk us through the political typology quiz that you all do and what it tells you about who we are as voters. Thanks. I have a couple of slides. Not, we're not going to go into a big, long presentation. But just to give you a sense of what the typology is, because I think I'm hoping some of you have taken the quiz. Uh, you know, We've had quite a lot of people take the quiz since we released the report last week. Um, and really what the quiz is, is it's a way into this report, which is actually based on you know, a, a really rigorous poll. And what we do is we've done this basically, some version of this going back to 1987. Um, to really understand the textures and contours of the American political landscape among the public, we talk so much about Republicans and Democrats in Congress, and that's what a lot of people see. But really, at, at bottom, all of those people represent you and your fellow citizens. And so what we do is we segment the public based on political values, attitudes about the parties, which is not unimportant. People have feelings about Republicans and Democrats, and, uh, and those aren't always linked to what they feel about political values and issues. Uh, and then how they feel about the political system as a whole. So you can see we do a big poll, we ask a lot of questions, and for this year's political typology, we use 27 to create it. And if, in the Q&A, if you have questions about it, happy to talk about it. Um, and then there's a quiz, which many of you have taken, which is actually a little bit of a truncated version of the, 
the poll. But really, this year we identified nine different political groups in, in the American public. Three that tilt Republican, I'm sorry, four that tilt Republican, four that tilt Democratic, and one that's really divided uh, about equally between the two parties. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about each one. So on the Republican side, these are the four typology groups. Faith and flag conservatives who are deeply conservative in pretty much every dimension. They are incredibly politically active, strong supporters of the former president. Uh, they stand out, and you can tell from their name, they stand out in their attitudes about re the relationship between religion and public life. They really want to see government support religious policies and religious freedoms. Then we have committed conservatives who are nearly as conservative as uh, the faith and flag conservatives, but they do differ on a couple of dimensions. And I think what's really interesting is particularly on things like immigration. They're not what those of you who may be democratic in orientation, they're not moderate in that sense, and they're certainly not liberal, but they don't, they're not quite as hard line when it comes to immigration policy, for instance, and that, that shows up in a couple of other areas as well. They are a much smaller part of the Republican Party. Um, and then we identify a group that we call the populist right. Uh, and they too are incredibly strong supporters of the former president. Uh, they also are very conservative nearly across the board, especially on issues about immigration uh, and, and some other issues in, in similar domains. But one of the things that really distinguishes them uh, is their own financial situation. They're, they're much less financially secure than those other two groups I just mentioned. And they are also highly critical of the economic system. They don't necessarily think that government has a role, but they do, you know, have a really critical view of banks and corporations, uh, and, a, of, and they're actually, majority of them support raising taxes on the wealthy, which those of you who understand American politics, that's not a consistent a position consistent with traditional Republican orthodoxy. Uh, and they're, near, they're the same size as the faith and flag conservatives. Both of them are the biggest groups uh, within the Republican coalition. And then finally, we identify a group we call the ambivalent right. What's interesting about them, they're much younger than the, the other three groups. They're more likely to consider themselves moderate, though they are similarly conservatives, especially around uh, issues of government. So meaning that they are no more likely than the other groups to think that government should be bigger, uh, or to, and they're also quite conservative when it comes to attitudes about business. Uh, but they do distinguish themselves in some of their attitudes on social issues, in particular issues like abortion and legalization of marijuana. They are uh, almost closer to the democratic attitudes uh, when it comes to that. They're also the most likely among these groups to not really feel at home within the Republican Party. More of them identify as independents who lean Republican than as Republicans, and they, they express other attitudes that suggest that they're not terribly happy uh, with, with the Republican Party as it currently is. And they're also less likely to vote and be engaged in politics. A quick snapshot of the Democratic side. So we have four groups that make up the majority of the Democratic coalition. And here, too, we see internal textures. Right? So if we start at the bottom of this slide here, uh, the most politically active group is a group we call the progressive left. Now, what's interesting about this group is that they are uh, pretty small. They're one of the smallest typology groups. Uh, they are very liberal. They're the most likely to call themselves very liberal. Not just liberal, but very liberal. And they have across the board liberal attitudes, including when it comes not just to the overall attitude itself, but to the extent to which change needs to, to come. So you asked them, a, we have asked them a question about uh, is there more to be done when it comes to addressing racial equality uh, in the country? Pretty much all the Democratic groups, majorities, clear majorities say yes. Progressive, then we follow up and we ask people, well, can you change things from within the system or do you really need to completely rebuild the system? And progressive left say completely rebuild the system. And that's not true of the other Democratic groups to the same extent. They're relatively affluent, they're relatively young as well. Um, and, and they're certainly among the loudest voices in the Democratic coalition. Then we identify a group we call establishment liberals, who in many ways are nearly as liberal. Uh, you look at their attitudes on most policies, they're about twice as large as the progressive left. 
Uh, but when you ask them questions about uh, that question I was giving you as an example about need for sy systemic change, they're less likely to say that yes to that question. Similarly, on questions about climate change, for instance, the progressive left really stand out not for the need to invest in alternative sources, everyone on the Democratic side says this, but for the degree and speed with which that change needs to happen. And then uh, we can move over to the Democratic mainstays, who deeply devoted Democrats, strong supporters of the president. Uh, they are, again, if you look at their attitudes, quite liberal, though veer more moderate on issues of immigration and also on uh, the US military the US place in the world. This group is a group that's much more likely than those two other groups I was mentioning to say that the you know, US should maintain its military strength. Uh, it's a group that says, you know, we really should maintain our superpower status. And you also see this shine through a, a more, more moderation, more conservatism when it comes to an attitude, say like police funding. This is a group that does not subscribe to the notion that police funding should be decreased. And that contrasts with the progressive left. It also contrasts with the fourth group, the, the outsider left. What's interesting about this group, this is an incredibly young group, the youngest group in the entire political typology. They are, you can see in a lot of ways, they are closer to the center in their attitudes about the two parties, but they are nearly as liberal as the progressive left on a lot of attitudes and issues. But they are quite dissatisfied with the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party. They're, nothing is pulling them towards the center. They're, they're highly unlikely to vote for Republicans, but I think there's an open question whether the Democratic Party can engage them um, in traditional partisan, uh, you know, partisan politics. They're not super happy with the Democratic Party as, as it is. And then the ninth group is a group we call the stressed sideliners. And this is a group that's about evenly Republican and Democratic. They're the least politically engaged group. They're among the most financially stressed. Uh, and, the, and, and you can see in their attitudes, they're split roughly, they're really quite in the middle, uh, in that they tilt a little bit liberal on economic issues, a little bit more conservative on social issues. But the main issue is that they don't really feel terribly at place within either party. And they're also, you know, because of their financial stress and other reasons, they're just not as plugged into politics, particularly as those groups, the faith and flag conservatives and the, the progressive left, the contrast is, is really strong there. So that's the overarching sense of what the political typology is. We, we're going to talk about all the details, uh, but I just wanted, especially for those of you who haven't had a chance to take a quiz, I wanted to make sure you had a sense of what it is we were talking about. Uh, and again, mostly the aim of this project is to really give an x-ray into the public and politics today that doesn't rely just on you know, Republicans and Democrats. That certainly is the case in electoral politics. Often we are just looking at those two groups, but there's a lot of texture within both of them. And I think you know, it shows through even in electoral politics and primaries, but, um, but it's an important dynamic to just understand when we're trying to understand American politics today. So I will stop there and we can dive in to Thank what's you. next. Thank you so much. Uh, Tony and John, I wanna bring you guys into the conversation now. Um, as two people who have had to navigate incredibly contentious and complicated party primaries for your, um, for your clients, as well as then a general election. Let's keep it focused on the parties for a second, the, the, each party's coalition, and then I wanna broaden it out from there. And using this as, as the starting point, I'd love for each of you to kind of answer a similar question, right? Like what is a Republican today? What is a Democrat today? What is it that they are looking for? And do you see in your research the same types of things that Jocelyn just outlined in her, uh, the same sort of coalitions within each party framework that, uh, that show up in the topology? John, you wanna start? Yeah, listen, I, I think, to, you know, if we're being honest with each other, are we? Yeah. I'll, um, I'll go if you go. <laughs> is that, listen, the Democrats, we have a much more diverse party. And I don't say that as a criticism. I just say it as a, a friggin' reality of the last three months, 
watching the reconciliation and the Build Back Better uh, bill uh, try to get um, negotiated among Democrats, right? It is a really big party ideologically, demographically uh, as well. Um, and so you can see that it can be, you know, it can be tricky. The fact is, is that what we see up here is in some ways what we saw in 2020. There, this kind of breaks the myth of what the Democratic Party is. I remember at the beginning of the Biden campaign, we had these decks about what our path to victory was before we did any polling. And also we did a big breaking the myths of the Democratic Party, which was that it was some like AOC convention, right? That it was an ultra liberal caucus where in reality, if you take a look at this, the Democratic Party is probably 50% moderate and 50% what you might call liberal or ultra liberal, right? Um, the fact is that there's different sections even within that, like ultra liberals and progressives, et cetera. But I think that what we would say in terms of what we stand for uh, every, you know, every day is, you know, it used to be you would ask a question in a focus group, what's a Republican, you know, what's the word that describes Republicans, what's the words that describe uh, Democrats, and it was always, for Democrats, working people. We don't get a lot of that now because of branding, et cetera, from, from Republicans. But the fact is, is I think that what we're seeing, for example, with Build Back Better and what President Biden ran on, it was about creating opportunities for working families to have a opportunity in the economy, in the new economy, because pre-pandemic, uh, we were seeing that, quite frankly, again, you know, wages weren't rate being uh, uh, increasing. Uh, we weren't seeing, for example, the wages outpace um, uh, uh, costs, et cetera. And people weren't feeling that they were benefiting from the economy. And so I think that that really encapsulizes, you know, our principles within the Democratic Party is that we're trying to create a lot of opportunities for people to succeed uh, in the economy that, uh, the, the economy now and the economy in the future. I'm gonna come back in a minute to talk about some of the tensions within each party, yeah. but, but Tony, I wanna start, uh, like, what is a Republican today? Uh, well, I, I think, and, and one of the things I think Jocelyn and the Pew study underscores is that um, the overarching umbrella that still kind of brings all Republicans together is uh, the notion that they do not want bigger government. They don't like big government. And uh, I think the other piece that brings the party together is their sense on economic issues. Uh, yes, there is a segment of the party that the populist right that would like to see taxes. They're, they're in favor of raising taxes and they're not so trustful of corporations. But the other 70 some odd percent of the party still believes in those basic principles of lower taxes, less spending, more freedom. Um, the other piece I think uh, that shows here is that there is a, a big difference in the in the observance or the religiosity uh, between the two parties. In fact, it's one of the biggest spreads that you see between them. If you go from the progressive left to the flags and uh, the uh, you know the flags and faith Republicans, it's a huge spread. It's the 60 point spread in the importance of religion in their lives. And I think that also brings together Republicans largely. Now, there is a difference whether or not you think that public policy should follow God's law but that has nothing to do with your personal observance about republicanism. I would argue with my dear friend here when he says that we're less diverse in terms of the splits within the party. I think what's happened is, is that if you go back a decade, maybe even more, the Republican Party had as many visible divisions as the Democratic Party did. And there were fights between hawks and isolationists and supply siders and deficit hawks and you know the religious right and the non you know the non-religious right and they're still those pieces are still there in the Republican Party. The difference is is that Donald Trump, for better or worse, managed to stuff all of those into a box and make it largely about him and about really? his beliefs and his politics. Yes, really, that happened. Did you pay attention did, to that? It, you, really, you, it you, was you, stunning. You observed that? It, it was that's stunning. It. it still is stunning. I know. It still is it's stunning. It's beautiful. But, but I think, uh, <laughs> well, it was beautiful for you guys. 
Um, uh, but but I, I do think that those divisions are still there in both parties. It's just a function of how they're focused on it. Right now, because Biden is the president, and you know he said something that I thought was so true, and I told John, that when you have a 50-50 Senate, every senator is president. Right. Right. And that's so true, because, and that's why the focus is on them and not us. We seem more united, but if we were governing, probably the splits would show more. The only thing I would disagree with is this, is that when we take over a chamber, whether it's the House or the Senate, we're doing it with moderates. Like we took over in 2006, Pelosi became speaker because basically, a bunch, at that time, we still had them, a bunch of Southern Democrats won in places like Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, Alabama, mm -hmm. North Carolina, Kentucky, right? And when we won in 2018, all the frontline Democrats who we're going to be basically protecting now are all moderates, right? And that doesn't happen. You guys win in a different wave scenario. And again, not being critical, but when you take a look at 10 and 14 and maybe 20, 22, um, the fact is, is that you're not going to be winning with a bunch of moderates. Are you suggesting that our people would be out of the mainstream? <laughs> you will not be winning with a bunch of moderates. And that's what I mean by, you know, the, the fact that I do think that we're a little bit diverse, not only in terms of what our caucus looks like, you, you have to admit there. But the one other thing, and, and maybe you have an observation of the Democratic uh, um, topo uh, topography is the one thing that I think is really interesting and is causing absolute agita, that's a word that us old Italian Americans use, uh, heartburn, um, is the fact that the populist right. And I don't know if that's a new one or if it's growing, but the fact is, is that there is this, we're, we've picked it up over the last um, two or four years where there is a reaction is very, I think, Trump driven there's different reasons for the reaction for anti-corporate with Republicans and Democrats. A lot of it is, you know, maybe they feel like they're, you know, you know stopping, you know, tech companies are stopping uh, Trump from expressing themselves, et cetera, et cetera. But this is a fairly new thing um, that we're seeing. And there's actually a coalition with the Bernie Sanders yeah. types or the Warren types, she's gonna be here next, year, next week, and some of the Republicans Absolutely. taking on, I mean, if you saw Marco Rubio's speech taking on corporate America, I think it was last week, yep. it's worth taking a look at because it was, you know, a mother from, or, or a son from another mother, whatever yeah, it's yeah. called, yeah. in terms of, this was language that is very populist in the in democratic well, way. I, I, w I would say that it's, it's new to their topography, um, but I've looked and done topology studies of the Republican Party and as back as far as 96, 97, there was a group that we called cultural populists. Now they had a different frame right. that they Why? were focused on. They were focused on affirmative action. Yes. They weren't as focused on immigration. What that morphed all the way through the early 2000s when immigration became a bigger issue. And what happened is, is you're right, Donald Trump gave voice to those people and actually grew that segment inside our party and the it's really odd that you see that it's flipped in that in all the elections before you had, uh, you know, white, non-college educated voters that voted heavily Democratic and college educated plus voters voting Republican. And now it's flipped right. completely the opposite well, way. And the other populist thing is that there's still about 40 or 45 percent of self-identified Republicans who support the tax portions of Biden's plan, meaning that they feel that big corporations don't pay their fair share Can of their ultra wealth. Yeah, <laughs> right, don't pay their fair share. And I think that that's actually uh, fairly significant as well. Right, and I would just add that, that I don't, I think even in our data, I wouldn't say the populist right came out of nowhere. Yeah. You know, right. certainly yeah. you go back to, you know, the, even in the 90s, but certainly by the 2000s, yeah. And, and I, I think you're absolutely right. What you see, see is that group emerge as a bigger group and as a group that kind of, again, in our typology, becomes its own group. It becomes yep. big enough to be its own group. But the DNA of that group was there. Yeah. But, but the reasons absolutely. were different, like Tony was saying. It, much different reasons now, and it's particularly negative towards big tech companies. Well, but here's, but, but let me jump in, because I've been arguing this for, for a little while, and I'd be curious if you all agree with this or not. This has been 40 to 50 years in the making, yeah. right? I mean, if you the think- The divide. If, well, this sort of anti-establishment fuel 
to the divide. And I would, I've been arguing that I think part of the problem in this town is that we're all always talking about left versus right, but that's not the paradigm anymore, that the paradigm is more sort of front versus back, people who feel left out, stuck at the back of the line versus the people they see at the front. If you look at, you know, Jimmy Carter running as an outsider in the post-Watergate and Vietnam era when people's trust in government had plummeted. I'll never lie to you. Right? And then Ronald Reagan getting uh, on a very different kind of populist sweep, but a bit of a populist mm -hmm. sweep, right? Like also, right, government is continuing to fail you. Bill Clinton winning in 1992, fighting for the forgotten middle class, right? And, and the fact that the middle class was feeling left behind. You know, Barack Obama running against special interests in 2008. One year later, the Tea Party and the Occupy movement ascended at the same moment, moment running against Wall Street and Washington. There's an anti-institution, anti-establishment sentiment because people have lost trust. Pew's done a lot of work on trust in institutions, as have other organizations. People have lost trust in almost every major institution. So if we're going to talk about the divide, in our politics, it seems to me like that's the starting point. It's not just a lack of trust in government, big tech, yeah. Wall Street, every major institution except the for the media, military, right? The media. Academia. Yeah, oh, academia, definitely. Right? Definitely. And, and, and like, and yeah. both parties are dealing with some of that internally right. in different ways, but. But I would say that, listen, I think that in some ways what the catalyst of the divide is always economic. Um, you went through a bunch of different presidents, mm -hmm. and I would say that, you know, what Clinton was tapping into, feel my pain, you know, that type mm -hmm. of thing, mm -hmm. is much different than what Trump was tapping into, which was, you know, I'm the victim, and it's because of them, right? I mean, it, he was expressing the bubble in people's heads that they didn't feel that they could say, because they were gonna be politically incorrect, they would be beaten down, that this guy said, and not of it, not much of it was pretty, quite frankly. But my point being is that there were, again, there were different catalysts or different reasons that they, that I think in each of those scenarios, that president or presidential candidate was tapping into something mm -hmm. that was basically economic. I, I, I don't disagree with my friend uh, that it, the catalyst is largely economic. Although I would say that it has been coming for the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, I know it's gonna shock some of you in the room, but Donald Trump did not invent the slogan, Make America Great Again. That was <laughs> Ronald Reagan's slogan in 1980. Uh, just an oldie but a goodie, comes back. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that this has accelerated because of the loss of faith and trust in the media and the explosion of internet, social media, all of those things, because now what has happened is we have, and we talked about this, I say it all the time, we have a more informed electorate, but not necessarily a better educated electorate. So they know how to look for information, but the information they look for is information that already fits their preconceived notion on issues. And so when they do that, the big tech companies, their algorithms see what they look at, and they just feed them more of the same stuff over and over and over again. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like being a hamster on a wheel, where if you look at Breitbart, they're going to continue to feed you Breitbart. And you're going to get Breitbart, and you're going to get OAN, and you're going to get Newsmax. There is, and even the left doesn't necessarily trust the media anymore. When you sit in focus groups and you listen to people talk about it, it is astonishing how they they just don't have any faith that what they're seeing on TV, you know, it used to be when we did TV commercials, we didn't have to put a citation on the TV spot and the voters would believe it. Oh yeah, he voted for that. Then we had to put the citation. Now when you put the citation and you show them in focus groups, oh, like people, they're like, yeah, yeah I don't listen, believe that. People, I'm going to go look that up. Listen, I'm going to Google it right people's, now. <laughs> people's bullshit meters are up oh, here. Yeah. Um, and I actually think that you know, uh, in each campaign that we're in right now, you have to almost be so pure in your negative attack. And matter of fact, 90% uh, of Biden's ads were positives because we just saw that people didn't want to see Trump in ads. They were done with it. They had made. They just wanted to know what he was they about. They didn't want to see him in his ads. Yeah, right. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> now, now, the only thing that I would, I, I don't know if I would disagree, but I'll challenge um, uh, the notion that this is all about mistrust. 
because it's a chicken and the egg situation. I think that it's hard to, again, say that Trump did not reinforce the mistrust, uh, did not reinforce dis, uh, disinformation, um, and really became the, the poster child of that, right? Uh, and has driven this. And so I think that, that that has, without a doubt, his four years in office, but when you think about it, he was there for you know running for president, he's been post-president, the six years that were in there, the disinformation and uh, the negativism um, has created mistrust that is even higher than it was, or quite frankly, would have been if you would have had you know a John McCain or a Romney or a Marco Rubio, et cetera. And I think that it, that that's kind of hard to debate. Sure, I I think though I think a way that I often think about this is is to Mo to your point. We've been in a period of profound d distrust in institutions that predates Trump, mm -hmm. right? And 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 trust in government is at, at record lows. And in some ways, that's the fertile ground, right? That's the fertile ground for what you were just talking yeah. about, right? So, you know, the, the counterfactual is a, a higher trust in institutions, higher trust in government, society. There, that that fertile ground wouldn't have been there. So, so the two kind of have to interact gotta, yeah. to get together. Yeah. And the, it's a the perfect other, storm. Like right. if you get someone like Trump to literally metastasize the 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 trust problem is going to only intensify. And quite frankly, there's always been political divide, no doubt about it. I mean, you know, if it's you were- It's just the, di the discourse that's been around it. Right. That's yes. the difference. It is it's always caustic. Been there. Well, and, and the lack of- I, mean, I, I think Joe Biden should stop being caustic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we didn't explicitly say this, and, and it probably predates many of you, but those campaigns from the 2000s and certainly before then, the, the media was shared. There weren't these, like you yeah. couldn't choose your own media. Yeah, right. you, you, you all right. kind of got news from the same places, yep. and it's impossible to separate yep. that yeah. from, from the dynamics. Right. But we, let, let's again clarify that in your own poll, I can't remember what the percentage, maybe three quarters, of self-identified Republicans do not believe that Joe Biden won the election. Oh, All right. It was three quarters. It, it was, it, it's, it, it, so it depends it's, on which grouping. It, yeah, it, it depends oh, on the which. Oh, the faith that flag conservatives okay, definitely don't believe. Call it. me a liar for 60%. But <laughs> no, I mean, no, but you know, I'm not. It's, it's a clear is, majority. It's a clear majority. majority. Yeah. And so this isn't just, you know, this is, this is a new level of distrust that we have. Yeah. Right. Because of, a, again, because of a big lie. <laughs> So I want to get to student uh, and audience questions in just a couple of minutes because their questions are always better than mine. But I do want to ask a, a couple more before we do that. Um, you know, Joe Biden ran on part of his message was he was going to help unify the country after a particularly divisive period of time. What is it, based on all of your research, right, what is it that can unify these groups, or at least a coalition of these groups. Because right now, we're seeing trouble unifying the coalitions within each party. Is there, when we say we're going to unify, that we're, that's our goal, what does that even mean right now? Infrastructure, Mo. Right. So don't. No, no, listen. Problem solved. No, uh, listen. I, I think that there's a little. Like a I think too too unify I think there's, right. <laughs> there's, you can get oversimplistic about uni unity, right? I mean, there's a there's a kumbaya unity, yeah. which people don't believe in, and then there's a <laughs> unity of just getting things done, and that's what we found in our research with Biden is that what they meant by bringing people together, it was about getting things done. We saw a little bit about that, you know, American Recovery Act, now the bipartisan right. infrastructure, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it takes two to tango, quite frankly, right? I mean, you have to have partners on each side uh, to be able to do that. We saw that on infrastructure. Um, I doubt if we're going to see it on anything else. We're not going to see it on the debt limit, even though during, you know, uh, Trump's uh, tenure, I don't know how many times they Republicans rose the, the debt limit. So, you know, and maybe that would happen on both sides. But the fact is, is that I think we're at the end of being able to get people together. And we're now counting on our majority in the House, which is slim. And the fact that, you know, all 50 of the Democratic senators are basically U.S. presidents, right? right. Like you just said. And, you know, the, getting things done is really what people mean by unity. It's not about, you know, holding hands. Yeah. 
I, and you know, uh, thank you. Going that, to get a Coca Cola. I needed that. I, 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 uh, he does a lot of hand holding with me. Uh, <laughs> we're huggers. You yeah, we're we huggers, right? I, I would, I would agree with John that uh, it, it's not the kumbaya sense. It's bringing people together to get something done for the common good. I will tell you that you know, it, for me looking at it, um, I think. Things have gotten to the point where to get the kumbaya moment would take something, a, a, a natural disaster of some type, or another war. attack or a war. Or and a I'm pandemic? not even sure a war I depends mean, a pandemic on pandemic could do it. No, 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 no. Because, because yes, it, it had a chance of doing that at the beginning. Um, but the, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, if you go back and you think about what happened after 9-11, um, that is the type of event, unfortunately, we don't want that to happen. Right. And we shouldn't have to have that happen for people to come together. But it's where it transcends everybody's ideology and it becomes an us versus them. And, you know, it's, you know, we're no longer enemies. We have a common enemy and it's not us. And interestingly, 9-11, if you look historically at midterm elections, it saved Bush from not losing a chamber. Yep. And then he got reelected. And then he lost the chambers, yep. you know, and so crushed. It, it, right, crushed. crushed. And it really was, again, you know, it was a settling moment for yeah. America to kind of reflect, et cetera. Um, again, pandemic could have been that, but. Um, but the counter, situation. the counter point to 9-11 is, yes, there was a lot of national unity around in the immediate wake of, but. But it didn't take that long. It right. wasn't that many years later yeah. before. But, yeah. and, and, in, and in fact, maybe some of the response, the current moment of polarization is an outgrowth of some of the, the right. reaction to September 11th. Well, the uh, that's war, a little too The war certainly yeah, was so, polarizing. It, it, sure. That's what caused the polarization. It would be very interesting. It always the if, ands, and buts, right? It would be very interesting if. if we have not gone into Iraq. Right. Or, you know, mm -hmm. the fact is, is that 9 11 happens and, you know, Iraq war was definitely the, the, the you know, uh, what brought Bush down in, in, in a sense, yeah. and what we, why, one of the reasons we got Obama. And so it would be interesting if that didn't sure. happen, yeah. you know, to see if it had extended so, anymore. Let me ask one last. And I just, be, because yeah. I just, for historical purposes, like, we, very, we were really close to immigration reform passing between Democrats and Republican under W, right? There were a bunch of things that had Iraq war maybe not gotten in the way, I don't know. You're looking with skepticism. I, we were I am, close. I am skeptical because what happened is Bush got way out in front of his skis on that. And when the base finally figured out what was going on and it got framed as amnesty, that was the end. They pulled yeah. back on those skis really fast. And let's not forget the last president to do amnesty was Reagan. Ronald but let's Reagan. not get in that. Let's not get so in let that. So let me, let me ask one last sort of bucket of questions and then we'll open it up. Yeah, and that is the incentive structure for this, right? I mean, we, you, ask, you ask anybody, do you want there to be more civility? Do you want us to come together? And like 90 plus percent say yes, they want us right. to come together. But then, you know, you see things like a member of Congress say the most incendiary thing and can raise millions of dollars in 24 hours in small dollar donations. So why would they stop saying the most incendiary things? And you know, in the polling that we do out of the Institute where we track civility, one of my favorite um, data points is we ask people like, okay, do you want there to be more civility in politics? And 90 plus percent say yes. But then we ask it differently. Agree or disagree with the following statement. Common ground and compromise are noble goals we want our leaders to aspire to. Like 78% say they agree with that. Very next question. I am tired of leaders compromising on my values. I want them to stand up and fight the other side. And 73% say they agree, agree with that. Okay. So what is the incentive structure for our political leaders to push past yeah. the polarization? Do voters want us to truly be less polarized? Or are they just saying, common ground, sure, stand where I, just, I am and we're on common I, ground? I, I just did a, did a series of focus groups for a client <laughs> in the, that exact conversation. I. You know, I'm tired of Congress not getting anything done. One sentence. Two sentences later, it's like, but they compromise too much of their values to get things done. <laughs> and, 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 and how do you bridge that with somebody? You try to explain to them that there has to be compromised by its very nature means somebody gives up. 
The problem is, is that a lot of people now think compromise is you give up 65% of what you believe, so I get 65% of what I believe. And that's not the way it works, a true compromise, right? That's number one. Number two, you know, it's, you know, you talk about the candidates saying incendiary things. Think about the media structure that echoes it and glorifies it and uses it for clickbait. And that's what becomes the story in all of these places. It doesn't matter if it's some niche uh, website or a social media platform or whatever it is, they do it. That's what allows them to get the audience. And you're right, as long as they're gonna get attention, as long as they're going to raise the money, they're not gonna stop because instead of being rewarded for what would be considered bad behavior, uh, instead of being punished, they're being rewarded in, or, a, in a bizarre way. Not, and it's not just the clickbait or the, or the dollars, right? It's primaries, right? They're, they're, we're seeing people lose primaries for being too conciliatory or for, yes. right? Like, yeah. But, you know, I mean, look, you the primary fights, you know, uh, you also, you could also see people, for example, in his home state. Uh, if Judge Roy Moore tried to run in a Republican primary again, he'd never yeah. win. He'd never win a Republican primary again. It happens. You go too far, it gets there. The 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 real problem is is that um, there is a glorification of it, and it's not just by the party faithful on either side. When AOC says something, the left goes crazy and gives her money too. Just like when Marjorie Taylor right. Greene says something, it, it works on both sides. But, but part of what this is, and I think a lot of the, the points that you're making are that the incentive structure also is the most engaged people. And you saw it, you see it in the typology. The most engaged people are those <clears throat> progressive left and, and the faith and flag right. conservatives, yeah. right? And so to some extent, the you're incentivized to right. pull to those parts yeah, of the but, party. Um, but, and, and just to also say that another dynamic that you find is like, when, so a lot of people say, oh, well, just engage the middle. Just really, we should focus all our, <laughs> in. but when you engage the middle, they, like, but, they but become. He, but just like, <laughs> here's the big difference, again, between the Democrat and Republican. Yeah. If you take a look at primaries, right? First of all, in 2018, most moderates won Democratic primaries. Progressives didn't. That's why you got Gretchen Whitmer, right? That's why you got Steve Sislek, et cetera, et cetera, Ivers, et cetera. The, the, the reality is the incentive structure on the Republican side, and mostly because you kick our ass in redistricting, is that there's so many safe Republican seats that a lot of the governing has a lot more to do with the Republican primary universe than it does the swing voter universe. We still we have to win our majorities by frontline Democrats, moderate Democrats winning swing, swing voters. And often the reality is to keep your coalition, you have to, they have to win Republican primaries because they're afraid of being primaried by ultra conservatives. And this is gonna play out in 2022. The most entertaining season of 2022 is gonna be Republican primaries for, for Senate, House, and, and Governor because Trump is the big issue, he's gonna be uh, endorsing, and what you might consider um, the, the, the moderate or the favorite candidate uh, with a better resume isn't necessarily who's going to win. And if you remember 2010 and 14, there were seats, mostly Senate seats, that were dead bang winners for the Republicans. And Sharon Angle won in the Republican primary in Nevada, and Harry Reid beat him. And, you know, Christine O'Donnell, the, the, the supposed witch, won in Delaware, and Chris Coon beat him. What did you and, call her? The, the the witch. That's oh, what okay. she called herself. <laughs> oh, God damn. And then and then and then if you remember Joe O'Donnell, Joe Donnelly and, and you know Murdoch on the abortion thing, like they they nominated such you know out of the mainstream that it gave Democrats the opportunity to win some seats. And I actually think that's their biggest fear right now uh, because the infra the the incentive infrastructure is to get really conservative, not lose the Republican primary, but it often caused problems no, with mainstream. Our biggest fear is how are we going to sit 260 members of, how, of the House? <laughs> oh God, I love you. Uh, no, I mean you're going to have to go across <laughs> the aisle. Is that it? <laughs> I'll just add, I mean, I think some of that is that, as you mentioned before, the size of the conservative, you know, the, the, mm. the two parties are different in terms of how loud, not how loud the edges are, but how big 
those are, right? That the yeah, progressive left right. is a pretty small, pretty small group. share and that there is a, a pretty big group that we call the Democratic mainstays that are, they may not be as politically active, but they're politically active and they're more moderate. And so so the dynamics of those intraparty fights are, are just different. We are definitely not as ideologically diverse as the Democratic Party. It is, the do, it's a conservative dominated party. But it's that, also one, one part of your success is why they're in lockstep, man, yeah. lockstep. I mean, you know, you don't see the Republican caucus, they would never go through three months of this open fight on a bill. like. No. What we've seen with Democrats. All right. I'm going to pause there because I want to start bringing in some additional questions. Do we have a mic for? Right there. Oh, right here. Right in front of me, of course. Okay, so come on around. And if you have a question, line up over here. And when you get there, tell us. Um, uh, don't be bashful. Yeah, come, come on. on. Come on up. Rank serial number. Um, name, where you're from, school year. And then please frame your question Social in the form number, of credit a card number. question. Okay. Your typology. Your typology. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Because <laughs> you, you all took the out? quiz while sitting here, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, my name is Pratik. I'm a freshman, a first year in the college. Um, so, uh, jo Mr. Anzalone, I listened to you on uh, David Axelrod's podcast in July, and I know you talked about how the Biden agenda was looking good for the 2022 midterms. And I know, like, the Democrats were sort of riding high back uh, in, like, June, July, and a lot of things have changed. So I just, like, want to get your perspective on, like, what your thoughts on what's changed since then and, yeah. and your prognosis. You know, that's a great question. Um, and here's what's really interesting is that even though this Build Back Better agenda has been around almost the entire year and we've gone through this really messy process of trying to figure out what's gonna be in it. And we've had, you know, 100 or 2 million uh, spent on us against, but, but by the re Republican infrastructure, the popularity of it hasn't changed. And so what I would say to the, you about that is that, you know, hopefully we get something passed because people expect you to get something done. Uh, and there's a lot of impactful things here, right? Uh, and I won't go through all of that. But, it's a tough political environment out there. We all know that for Democrats. We just saw it in Virginia. We just saw a really close race in New Jersey. But the silver lining is it's November of 2021 and not September of 2022. And so what I would say is, is that we actually have some good tools in our toolbox in terms of having a potential strong message about what, we've, we're, what we have done for working families, small businesses, and seniors by, again, you know, doing impactful things on lowering costs of, of, of health insurance premiums, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, elderly care, um, uh, child care, parental leave, et cetera. So it's to be seen. Uh, back then, it was looking at you know, a different political environment. My point to you is when, we, when the bell rings in September of 2022, we're probably going to be in a different political, economic, COVID environment. And we may have a really strong message about what we've done for, for working families, seniors, and small businesses. Doesn't mean that we're going to keep the house. But I'll tell you what, it probably means that we're going to be more competitive than people in this city and the media think we are today. I have a, I have a really short answer. Oh, my God. And it's... <laughs> dun, dun, da dun, dun, da dun, da dun, da dun, da dun. <laughs> I love when the expectations are really, really high on the Republican <laughs> side. Right. Thanks for the question. All right, next. Hi, um, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm a freshman in the SFS from New York City. Um, my question concerns the accuracy of polling. So I think that there's been a lot of questions after the 2016, 2020 general elections, Senate <laughs> elections, about whether polling accuracy is declining. We've seen declining response rates, increasing educational polarization, polarization based on trust. Um, and we see that this has significantly affected where candidates campaign um, and you know, a multitude of ways in which Americans no longer necessarily believe that polling can accurately, quote unquote, predict the results. So I think, you know, as people who have polled for these campaigns, I'm curious um, what you think about, A, you know, what are the causes for why polling has, was less accurate in the 2016 and 2020 cycles, if you believe that is the case? And B, like, what is, do you think this is a fluke regarding like Trump or COVID? Or what do you think about like kind of the future of polling's ability to accurately give us a landscape of elections and what Amer the American public thinks? Uh, I, I think the, the worst thing about polling is the media polling. Uh, I think the media does polls to report a headline. They want to create a headline, they want to generate news. 
And the media oftentimes does their polling the cheapest way possible. And when you do your polling, the media doesn't do polls to figure out how to win a campaign. They do polls to figure out how to generate a headline. We do not do polls that way. We do polls to figure out how to win campaigns and how to help our clients and our candidates. And that is two different things that you're looking for. A poll, if you've taken statistics, you know that 95 out of 100 times, the poll will be right. Five out of every 100 times, it's just going to be wrong. It's the law of statistics. It's just the way it works. But more importantly, the universe in which you survey is important because the survey will only be representative of the universe you survey. So in 2016, uh, the media polls were surveying, were not surveying as many Republicans as actually showed up. In fact, Republican affiliation turnout was higher in several of the states that Trump won than it had been in 2012. And they also did not survey enough white, less than college educated voters, which had flipped to Trump previously from 2012, where they had voted for Obama. So you take those two factors, and they can turn a state that was maybe a plus two going in Democrat state and make it a plus one Republican state. And so, uh, and in 2020, um, there were just more polls and there was more noise. I, I think some of the media polls were actually pretty good. Some of them moved to a better methodology. There was some that were outliers that were still bad because they were doing online panels or they weren't interviewing registered voters, they weren't doing likely voters, a million different reasons. But my polling, and I'm sure his polling, I know his polling, we did not have the problems that they did because of the way we do our polling, because of the way we construct our sample frames, the universes that we sample from, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The only I thing know. I would add, and we've talked about this, is we're constantly innovating. So there yep. were, without a doubt, problems. We weren't, it wasn't just about not getting the right non-college white uh, uh, responses. It was getting the right type of non-college whites. Mm -hmm. For example, we were getting too many non-college whites in service industries instead of non-service industries. So we've done a lot. And there's just a universe that will not take a poll with a live caller, but we can now get them uh, in ways where they don't feel, you know, they don't trust institutions, they don't trust people, et cetera. So I do want you to know that we're, that we're doing a lot of innovation. We're spending a lot of money. Polling's super expensive. Yep. Um, and you just have to spend a lot of money to do it the right way. One of the things that we're probably one of the only two pollsters that do this extensively is we use a technology called SMS to web, where it allows us to get people who won't respond by phone and they don't have to talk to a live operator which there are a lot of voters that don't want to express their opinion anymore to live app operators. They don't want to be judged. All right, I want to try to get in a couple more uh, since we're coming up close to the end of our time. Hi, um, I'm Kesley. I'm a freshman in the college studying biology, ironically. Um, and my question is kind of for all of you, but mostly for Tony. Mm -hmm. I'm allowed to call you Tony, sorry. Um, okay. So if we can all agree that far right conspiracies like QAnon are harmful to our sorry, harmful to our democracy, why do we continue to engage these voters? For example, young can use dog whistle politics on issues like critical race theory and I mean okay, anyways. Um, <laughs> McCulloch kind of put his not McCulloch, yeah, McCulloch kind of put his foot in it. But anyways, point being is like why do we continue to engage these voters if we can like all agree as a consensus that it's actively like causing problems like January 6th? Well, I don't know that critical race theory calls January 6th. I do know that that McCulloch stepped in it in Virginia, and I do know that in some places there are problems where they're trying to teach critical race theory. And elections are all about letting voters decide. We can't predetermine. The moment we start predetermining what voters can and can't hear is the moment we become no better than the social media titans that decide who they're going to ban and who they don't ban. It's a question of free speech. And whether we like it or not, and whether we think they're crazy or not, they're still entitled to have their speech. But there's a responsibility on the other side, and that is the responsibility of the voter to be able to parse through and figure out what's fact and what's fiction from what they hear. QAnon is, their, their beliefs are nuts. I mean, one of their beliefs is that Angela Merkel is the granddaughter of Adolf Hitler. I mean, that's just provably untrue, provably untrue. But you know what? There are people who believe it, 
Do I agree with them? No. Should those people be able to not vote or express their opinion? No, they should be able to vote and express their opinion. And if I start censoring them, do I start censoring AOC because I disagree with her position on defunding the police? So here's what I would say, is that there is not a police of political rhetoric. Uh, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no one who kind of polices it. And 90% of Joe Biden's ads in 2020 were positive. Nearly 100% of Trump and Trump's allies' ads were negative. Just a fact. I mean, we can almost do the flip of it with Hillary. Hillary, a disproportionate percentage of her ads were negative. But the fact is, is that, it, again, you know, I don't believe you just get free speech to tell lies. We got hit a lot that Joe Biden wanted to defund police. Joe Biden actually does, didn't want to defund police. And we went on TV and we said, no, that's a lie. I didn't want to defund police. Actually, I want to, my plan says I want to increase funding for police departments. So there is this tension, right? I mean, you know, without a doubt, Joe Biden is president. And so every time you elevate that he is not president, any Republican, um, you know, that it was fraudulent, et cetera, it's not to me free speech. It's a lie, right? And so, but there's no one out there policing that. And as Tony was saying uh, uh, before, there's actually social media platforms who are elevating that. Um, and so there's a lot of problem out there with disinformation. I mean, every week we would get a disinformation report in the Biden campaign about what Trump and Trump's allies were saying about him. Horrific stuff, by the way. Um, and I always wondered what their disinformation stuff looked like on us, which we were just talking about differences in it's policies. The Steele stuff. dossier. Still, yeah, yeah, thanks. But you know what I'm saying? So I just want to, because I, I, you, you asked a very serious question, which is, I believe, incredibly frustrating in our political dynamics, is that there's no one out there who can stop political rhetoric or political lies or disinformation. It's just impossible. And you can't, you, because once you start doing that. Well, you can by not doing it. Well, you can, but you got to stop the people. But then you're, you, you, you can't stop people from lying. I mean, the one you thing. Can't. The you can't. You police no, lying? I'm not saying <laughs> y'all. That's the frustration. Yeah, I know. I mean, the one thing I'll add to bring it back to what we were talking about before yeah. is, again, the environment of trust and views of institutions, yep. right? In a time of low trust in institutions, distrust in the media, that provides the the fertilizer for some of this. That, but I, I, yes. and I, I'm not- but That's not, fine, but the bottom line is, right. is if Donald Trump had stood up there and said, you know, just like Hillary Clinton did, who lost by just almost the same amount in three states, and I was there, you know, watching her concession speech in the transfer of power of how this, if Trump had done that exact same thing and you were doing your polling right now, 80% of Republicans would have said, Joe Biden is the leg legitimate pr president. So I get the infrastructure of the foundation of trust, but there is a catalyst who is driving the big lie. Right. No, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I know disagree I'm not like, disagree yeah. agreeing with that. I'm not trying to sort of both sides right. it, but mm -hmm. I, I do think that, I do think it's important. You know, a lot of these things are really not in the domain of saying, we can't do this or, you know, right. they're, they're in the domain of what the political norms are and what behavior is incentivized by different, yeah. by different groups. We're at a new so, level. I mean, we yeah. have politicized science. Well, let's, and that's the, the thing, right? Like, I, to me, I just wonder, it's a whole chicken and egg thing for me, right? When I hear everything you're saying about the big lie, but like the other big one is COVID and vaccine hesitancy. And when the only time Donald Trump has been booed by his own voters at his own rally was when he went out there and talked about how he delivered the vaccine and he got booed by his voters, right? So where's, again, the incentive structure, what, chicken or egg, right? I, I, I think he's- Well, I, I actually believe the way Trump wins is just a little tweak on, you know, his presidency of, you know, on masks and, you know, responsibilities and things like that. 
And I don't think that his people would have left him, and he might have gotten you know those sixty thousand votes he needed. Yeah, maybe. You know, but the reality is, is that as president, gotta pres rub it in, don't you? Oh, I mean, you know, gotta you rub can it. give you can give me sixty thousand reasons why Hillary Clinton's not president. Yeah, damn it, I could. You know, so I could keep rubbing. Email. I, I, well, no, I, I didn't. <laughs> All right, let's get one more uh, in. I keep. I'm about to get the hook, so let's try to get one more in. And for those of you in line, I'm sorry, but um, we'll try to get we'll you. We'll stick next around. They'll stick around for a few. Hi, uh, my name is Sanjay. I'm a junior in the. the Can you get a little bit closer to the mic. Sure. I'm a junior in the business school, and I am from the Maryland suburbs of DC. Um, so we talked a lot about the lack of trust in institutions, both from both sides of the political spectrum, and it seems to me that the distrust comes from two different, you know, perspectives. On the left, it's a lot more economic distrust, distrust of corporations, the economic system, the rich. And on the right, it's much more about sort of public-facing institutions, universities, media, um, you know, politicians. I'm wondering where you see a possibility for institutions of both varieties to start gaining trust again, if that's possible. That's a great question. Um, and sort of why sort of trust in institutions is so you know, diverged. Wowza. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wowza. I mean, I'll, one thing I'll add while That's everyone's... That's your question, Jocelyn. Well, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you, you can like figure out what the solutions are. I'll add to the diagnosis of oh, the problem. No, no, no. Um, I do think it's also, I, I think that's that's a great question. But I also think it's worth looking at trust in government and looking at partisan trust in government. And one of the things that's really important to understand is, of course, it switches, right? Democrats are more trusting than they were when Trump was in office and, and vice versa. But if you look at this line, Democrats today are not terribly trusting in government in this generic trust in government way. And the same thing, Republican trust in government was nowhere near where it was under Ronald Reagan, under, under Trump, or even under Bush, right? Trump may be unique in a lot of ways. And so I do think, I just wanna point to that I don't think it's just these kind of certain institutions are places that Democrats trust. and. But there is something a, a, a little more profound. I think it's a real challenge. It's, it, and I'll leave it to these guys to figure out the solution. <laughs> I, 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 there is, this is very sad to say, at least from the Republican perspective, the institutions that you talk about that have washed trust, that, that the Republicans have washed trust in, there is absolutely no incentive to regain trust in them. And the reason for it is, particularly on the terms of the media, is there is just so many different ways and channels that people could get information that I don't need to search for what is the absolute truth. I can search for my truth. Right. And I know that's a, that's a dangerous place to be, but, um, and, and by the way, go back 50 years, that was not the case. It was not the case. You know, this is a really sad thing. You're gonna hate this is that we ask a question in our demographics that's not even about institutions. Do you generally trust other people? Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. You want to know why it's hard to get certain responses, right? And that number is like, it's, it's approaching 30%. So it's not just about institutions. It's also about just trusting other people, right? And I think we forget that we're in our 20 months of the pandemic as well, and this has accelerated this. Like, we're all fatigued and, again, politicizing, you know, uh, masking and things like that. But at the same time, if you're looking for a little hope, there was that time in April and March, and uh, I'm sorry, April uh, in May and June of 2020, when, strangely enough, because people weren't trusting Trump, People were trusting their governors. They were looking for a place to get good information that they could trust. So it didn't matter whether you were a Democrat or a Republican or an independent governor, that's where people were going. And whether you were a Democrat or Republican, those their job ratings and trust numbers were going through the roofs, like literally sometimes in the mid to upper 60s. Yeah. Uh, now that dissipated once people got fatigued and mask mandates and all that type of stuff went out. So you occasionally see just a little blip uh, but I don't. I couldn't tell you what the next blip is because it's pretty dire out there it right is. now. People are sour, and people think that it's just the political side of it, and or Biden or Trump or that Pelosi or you know Schumer or you know McCarthy or whatever. But the fact is, we don't put enough into the fact that we're 20 months into a pandemic, and we are a fatigued country. I love ending on an optimistic note. 
<laughs> I, it's pretty clear I'm not going to get it from these two. So I'm going to leave it to Jocelyn. Take their quiz. Take the topology quiz. See That's what right. you are. Um, look, our motto, our slogan at the Institute is public service is a good thing. Politics can be, too. Um, that feels like it's been tested. Wow, that's a shot yeah. against you and I. I well. um, it's been tested a lot lately. Yeah. But um, I got to say, um, in an era when we don't trust one another and Democrats and Republicans sure as heck don't look like they even like each other, Thank you guys for modeling what an actual conversation could look like yes. once again. So, John, Tony, and, thank and, you. And, um, and we should have said this at the beginning, is that this is a really important, special place for us because both of our daughters graduated from Georgia, and I know Tony's daughter's in the audience. And this is just a splendid place with just an amazing I, I think administration. We, I think we paid for one of those cannons Yeah, we probably did. We paid something. So uh, we wanted to let you know that... that you know, for four years of our lives, yeah. or more, more for years, yeah. this was an incredibly special place. Yeah. So it's special for us to be here, yeah. too. Thank so you. thank Welcome you, Welcome back to campus. Thank you, Justin, thank, thank you, you and the Pew for being our partners on this event and for all the work that you do. We still all have a lot more work to do to sort of deconstruct what's going on and tackling the polarization. Can we come back after 22? Let's do it. So I could do let's, the jig? Let's do it. We'll, <laughs> we'll see how big of one, though. Um, oh. Uh, that's the old DNC guy in me coming out. Apologies. <laughs> apologies. Um, thank you all for sharing part of your night with us. Please stay tuned for more events. Our next big event is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving in Gaston Hall, where we will be having a conversation with Senator Elizabeth Warren about how we can level the playing field in conversation with our own geopolitics fellow, Rebecca Piercy. Um, so please come and engage in that conversation. And with that, have a good night. Thank we're, you. Where can Tony sign up for that?